the way that we pray says a lot about what we think about God. Unfortunately, the late singer Janis Joplin, I never dreamed I'd quote Janis Joplin in a sermon, by the way, um, and a lot of other people for that matter, view God as someone who exists to do their bidding and to give them what they want. She used to sing this, Oh Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? My friends all drive Porsches, I must make amends. Worked hard on my lifetime, no help from my friends, so oh Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? Some people see God as a big genie in the sky, right? He's, he's come out of a magic lamp. He's going to grant them their three wishes or however many, but that's not the God of the Bible. The all-knowing, all-seeing, sovereign God of the universe who desires to give his children what they really need. God does want to give good gifts to his children. Jesus emphasizes this when he uses the illustration of an earthly father giving gifts to his children that we're going to look at today. I know as a father and as a grand, now as a grandfather, I love to give gifts to my family. And I try to give good gifts, gifts they like or gifts that are helpful. I try to spoil a little bit, but I'm not all-knowing like God. And my gifts may not always be perfect. Every now and then, though, I have a flash of brilliance. But in all honesty, the hardest part for me is trying to figure out what to give. I started several years ago, you know, um, on the phone, there's a list app. So I have this permanent Christmas list app. And if I see something, I'll be like, Jared, da, 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 da. because come October, I'll be like, I don't know what to get him, you know. And so I try to keep a list to help me out. But God doesn't have that problem. He knows how to pick out the perfect gift for us. James, Jesus' half-brother, wrote this in his epistle. James 1, 117 says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. So let's take a look at what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mountain about prayer. Prayer must be important because he comes back to it. You know, he's already taught us how to pray and so he comes back to prayer here verse 7 chapter 7 keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for keep on seeking and you will find keep on knocking and the door will be open to you for everyone who asks receives everyone who seeks finds and to everyone who knocks the door will be opened you parents if your children ask for a loaf of bread do you give them a stone instead or if they ask for a fish, do you give them a snake? Of course not. If you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him? So Jesus has given us here some promises for prayer. This translation goes ahead and translates these keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking, and that really captures that, that verb tense here. It literally says, keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. And we see a progressive intensity here. It's going from asking to seeking to knocking. And so Jesus said, have some intensity, have some passion and persistence in your praying. And in this threefold um, description, I think we see three different aspects of prayer and different aspects of its reward. The first is prayers like asking. We just simply make our request known to God. It says everyone who asks receives. There's participation involved here. We can't expect God to answer prayers that are never prayed. Now, there are some who say, well, God already knows what we need. Or, well, God's going to do what he wants anyway, so there's no point in me asking. Except for the fact that God desires and tells us to come before him with our needs and our cares. Our walk with God is a relationship, right? And if there's never any conversation, there's not much relationship. 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. God cares about what you're going through. He's cared about what makes you anxious, what you worry about. 
But he says, hey, talk to me. Cast it on me. Let me carry that load for you. And Paul wrote this in Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. And then you'll experience God's peace, which exceeds anything that we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Receiving is the reward of asking. And Jesus says prayers like seeking. And that we search after God, we search after his word and his will, and the one who seeks finds. God promised this all the way through Scripture in both Testaments. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek His will in all you do, and He will show you which path to take. And in Jeremiah 29, 13, He says, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. You catch the energy of seek there, don't you? Seeking with all our heart, not casually, eh, maybe I'll look, maybe I won't. James said this in James 4, verse 8, he says, Come close to God and God will come close to you. There's passion involved here. Seeking means to look as if we're searching for something of great value. Fully expecting to find what we need. Finding is the reward of seeking. And then Jesus says prayers like knocking until the door is opened. And we seek entrance into the heavenly throne room of our king. There's a persistence involved here. Why do we knock on doors? So the person on the other side will open it and let us into their presence. This whole series has been called Turn the Upside Down Kingdom. And I think... As I was studying for this last week, this struck me as one of the ways that Jesus was turning things upside down. I made a connection as I was studying. I was reading through Hebrews during my my daily uh, Bible reading time and saw a connection I'd really never considered before. So if you have your Bibles and you want to, turn over to Hebrews Nine, it'll be up on the screen too. You get to Hebrews 9. The first few verses of Hebrews 9 describe the tabernacle. The tabernacle was the tent of worship. Uh, If you're reading through Numbers, there is a lot of details on how they were supposed to build the tabernacle. How long it was supposed to be, how wide it was supposed to be, the different areas that were walled off on the inside, what they were supposed to make stuff with. That was the tabernacle. That's where they worshipped. That was the center of worship until Solomon came along and said, well, let's build a permanent place, and they built the temple. But they used that same interior design. Let's pick it up at verse 6 here in, 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 in Hebrews 9. Verse 6. When these things were all in place, talking about the tabernacle um, layout the priests regularly entered the first room as they performed their religious duties this was the holy place but only the high priest ever entered the most holy place in some of your versions it'll say the holy of holies and only once a year and he always offered blood for his own sins and for the sins of the people and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance By these regulations, the Holy Spirit revealed that the entrance to the most holy place was not freely open as long as the tabernacle and the system it represented were still in use. So I want you to see here, there is no free access to anyone. Only the high priest can go in. He can only go in once a year. There's a wall, a thick curtain that separates the Holy of Holies from everyone And only the high priest could go through that. In fact, they would tie a rope to his ankle because if he hadn't properly gotten his heart right, got his sins taken care of, he would die in the presence in the Holy of Holies because he's in God's presence. And if they didn't hear the little bells on the end of his robe doing, then they had a way where they didn't have to go in and get him and they had drag him out. Oh, 
rough life, huh? So then the passage goes on, and it explains how animal sacrifices were accepted by God, but didn't really solve our sin problem until Christ became our sacrifice. And he lived a perfect life so he could fulfill all the requirements of an unblemished sacrifice. He died on the cross to pay for our sins, rising again on the third day, breaking the power of sin and death, offering us eternal life, and then returning to heaven as our advocate. Now, he's not in a man-made tabernacle or a man-made temple now, but he's in the presence of God the Father. So let's pick up things again in Hebrews 10, 10, 19. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter into heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Well, what happened to that curtain? There was a little cur a literal curtain in the temple, and it was about four inches thick or the width of a man's hand. That was the thing that kept separation between us and God. But Luke 23 tells us what happened to that curtain. Verse 44. This is during the crucifixion. By this time, it was about noon. And darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. And the light from the sun was gone. And suddenly, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn down the middle. And then Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with those words, he breathed his last. That curtain was torn from the top down. Now, I got to tell you, remember, you remember in the 90s, I think it was the 90s, it was really the power team or some of those weightlifting guys, they'd always, you know, they'd fold the phone book and they'd tear the phone book and they'd bend metal bars and all that stuff and then they'd give a testimony or whatever. And I, our church in, in Louisville had them come in and do that. No human is grabbing a four or five inch thick curtain and tearing it. It's 40 feet long, 40 feet tall. It's torn from the top to the bottom. No human did it. God ended the separation when Jesus willingly gave his life for us. Wow. Wow. So here's how Jesus turned things upside down. He said, knock on the door. We can knock on the door and it will be opened. Because when we commit our lives to Christ, we become God's children and the Father opens the door. And that's how Jesus described eternal life to his disciples when he was praying at the Last Supper, John 17, 1 through 3. After saying these things, Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so he can give glory back to you. For you have given him authority over everyone. He gives eternal life to each one you have given him. And this is the way to have eternal life. To know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent, the, sent to earth. Entering into his presence is the reward of knocking. And it's the best reward of all. And it's because of our relationship with him then that we can pray expectantly. This is not like the Wizard of Oz. You remember that? And he wasn't really much of a wizard after all, was he? But there's a lot of smoke and there's a lot of this stuff. And people went in and they were scared to death. Because he sounded so mean later on they found out he was this wimpy little old man. This is the creator of the universe. And Jesus said, just knock on the door. He'll open, he'll let you in. And his children were just knocking on daddy's door. Jesus explains it this way. He says, you parents, if your children ask for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? Or if they ask for a fish, do you give them a snake? 
course not. So if you simple people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good, give, give good gifts to those who ask Him? Jesus has taught that God does answer prayer. And then from the analogy, this analogy, we learn that His answers are always good ones. Because God is a good God. He's a loving God, a heavenly Father. He can be expected not only to answer our prayers, but to answer them in such a way that it's for our highest good. No earthly, well, few earthly fathers would be so cruel as to give their child something deceptive and harmful in the place of the food that the child asked for. So Jesus gives us the bottom line here. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask Him? If sinful men so love their children and provide for their needs, how much more will God? John Calvin expressed it this way. He says, if the little drops produce such an amount of beneficence, what ought do we expect from the inexhaustible ocean? I think one of the things Jesus is making clear here is that God doesn't have to be persuaded or appeased in prayer. Remember, he's already told us, don't blabber, don't blather. God wants to give us not just bread, but even more than than we ask. Prayer is not an incantation. You don't have to get the words just right. You don't have to put them in the right order. Remember, we talked a couple weeks ago, prayer is a conversation with God. And Jesus has told us, this is a conversation with your heavenly father. You're just going to your dad and saying, hey, dad, I need this. Or I want this. Listen, you don't have to buy a prayer mat that's been blessed by anybody. You don't have to send in a donation so that your prayer requests will be heard. That's a bunch of Don Quixote. (laughs) Prayer is a conversation with your Heavenly Father. You sharing your heart with Him and listening for Him to respond. Now, the idea of Father is scary for some people, isn't it? Maybe you didn't have the best earthly father. But don't let God's choice of presenting himself as a father scare you away. He is everything that your daddy wasn't. He will love you like a father ought to love his child. And you can trust him. Well, all who truly believe in Christ receive the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation. We all need to know more and more of the Spirit's fullness in our daily walk. Whatever our needs, whatever our our greatest need is to be filled continually with God's Spirit. And so Jesus instructs us to come as needy children and ask the Father to pour His Spirit out upon us. Now, Jesus is not promising that God is going to meet our every whim for material things or for earthly benefits. But he's promising that if something is for our spiritual good, and if we come as trusting children ask, the loving Father will give it to us. To this day, as far as I know, not once when my kids have asked for broccoli have I refused to give it to them. (laughs) On the other hand, candy and ice cream were sometimes met with a no. God may delay the blessing because he knows I'm not ready to receive it yet, He may have some purposes in training me in faith and prayer that require his withholding the request for the present time. He may know what I don't know, which I'm pretty sure is the case, that my request is not for my ultimate good. And so he may deny my request because he has something better for me. There were a lot of girls that got prayed for when I was a teenager and in college, oh Lord, this is the one. And he said, no, I got something better for you. He waited a long time, but 
Uh, I think there was a country star that had thank, uh, a song called Thank God for Unanswered Prayers. I thank God for un- unanswered prayers because when he brought what I needed, he brought Amy. That's just one example. The only one in that department. But <laughs> of other things that I like, God, this is the perfect thing. I need this. And God said, mm, yeah, no, we're going we're gonna to wait because I got something better in mind. Jesus is teaching that we should approach God with trust. Like a child will come to a loving father. And if, if my request is for my spiritual good, the father is going to give it to me. And so verse 11 brings us back to Jesus' instruction on how to pray. That we have to come, that we must come to know God as, as heavenly father. Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote this. He said, this is one of our main troubles, is it not? You should ask me, if you should ask me to state in one phrase what I regard as the greatest defect in most Christian lives, I would say that it's our failure to know God as our Father as we should know Him. Ah, yes, we say we do know that and believe it, but do we know it in our daily life and living? Is it something of which we are always conscious? If only we got a hold of this, we could smile in the face of every possibility and eventuality that lies ahead. God didn't often, or God often does not, put things into our hands until he first prepares our hearts. Someone said it this way, the greatest blessing of prayer is not just getting an answer, but being the kind of person that God can trust with the answer. I really like that. I'm going to read it again. Somebody has said it this way, the greatest blessing of prayer is not just getting an answer, but being the kind of person that God can trust with the answer. So what does it mean for me? I think the first thing it means is that we need to be persistent and consistent in our prayers. The verb tense that Jesus used, remember, is is to ask and keep on asking, seek and keep on seeking, knock and keep on knocking. Prayer should not be a one-time thing, but a lifetime habit. It shouldn't just be done when we're in a panic. It should be a regular part of our personal relationship with Christ. Amy and I didn't just have a conversation the day we got married. We've had plenty of conversations since then because we're in a relationship. Wouldn't be much of a marriage if we never talked, would it? My friendships with people wouldn't be very good friendships if we'd ever talked. If we say God is our Father... If we've committed our lives to Christ, there should be ongoing conversation. That's how you get to know somebody. And I think that persistence is the key, too. Not that we nag, but that we're persistent in building that relationship with God. As we ask, as we seek, as we knock, to ask for and seek understanding. Because we want to know God's will. We need to be persistent. There was a dad, he had a three-year-old son. They'd just gone through all the, the bedtime routines, you know, the, the reading a story, listening to prayers, answering a dozen questions, giving him a hug, saying good night four or five times before slipping out of the room. And after a long, hard day, the dad thought, ah, now I can relax. So he sat down in his recliner, and it's quiet for about five minutes before he heard... Daddy, can I have a drink of water? And he said, no, son, be quiet and go to sleep. And it's quiet for a couple more minutes, and then a little bit louder than before, Daddy, can I have a drink of water? No. He said, be quiet and go to sleep. And it's quiet for a little bit. Daddy, can I have a drink of water? Son, if I hear one more sound out of that room, I'm going to spank you. And you could hear a pin drop. And the silence was thick for about a minute. And then he heard, Daddy, when you come to spank me, could you bring me a drink of water? (laughs) The dad knew that his son at that point was thirsty and really wanted a drink of water because he was boldly persistent in his request. So we need to be persistent. We need to be consistent in our prayers. We need to seek God's will. 
Take time to search for God and what he wants you to do. Take time to let him show you things that need to change in your life. We're not to seek God just because we expect that he's going to give us some good gift in return. God created people with a desire to seek him. And so when we follow that God-given desire, we're doing something that's pleasing to him. Hebrews eleven six, And it's impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely ask him. We've got to seek God's will. And I'd say more than that, we need to seek God. What we need most, and what we should desire more than anything, is intimate fellowship with God. Jesus told, he's talking to the church here in Revelation 3.20. He says, look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. And we'll share a meal together as friends. Or, and we'll sup, is the, the version that we, that we know. That's why we can pray with confidence. Because God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit want to have fellowship with us. And our satisfaction comes from experiencing that. It means that we can be confident that God's gifts are best, that He knows what to give us, He knows when to give it to us, and how it's going to benefit us. And there might be times when we feel like God's silent or that He's ignoring our prayers, but the truth is, is that He is always working for our good. C.S. Lewis reminded us of the challenge that we face each day. He says, The moment you wake up each morning, all your wishes and hopes for the day rush at you like wild animals. And the first job each morning consists in shoving it all back, in listening to that other voice, taking that other point of view, letting that other, larger, stronger, quieter life come flowing in. So all those needs, all the worries, all the things that as soon as we wake up come and attack us, we just need to shove those back and say, I'll deal with you later. Right now, I need to spend some time with my dad. My heavenly father is waiting for me. My heavenly father, fortunately, allows me to get a cup of coffee before we do that. (laughs) I think if we grasp the truth of what Jesus is saying here, it changes our relationship with God. I really do think this is part of an upside-down kingdom. They knew a, seri- uh, a system where they couldn't knock on the door. They were on the outside looking in in many senses. They still had, many of them still had faith, but they couldn't experience that intimate fellowship with God in the same way because there had to be a priest that went through all those walls for them. But because of Jesus, we don't have those walls. And I think what Jesus is saying here listen you are God's children and you have the freedom to knock on the father's office door and go in and he'll do what's best for you so don't be afraid to ask don't be afraid to have a conversation with him and tell him what you need or what you think you need or even what you'd like but you have a relationship with your heavenly father Let's pray.